It is a pleasure to have this opportunity to present, and I would like to thank the organizers. These are my disclosures. At the Sanger Institute, we are using large-scale systematic approaches to understand how somatic variation in cancer genomes creates therapeutic vulnerabilities and impacts on therapy response. We have developed a preclinical ecosystem combining cell model generation, genome analysis, functional perturbation, analytics, and detailed mechanistic studies to identify new therapeutic strategies. As part of our work, we have launched the Cancer Dependency Map. This aims to use large-scale functional genomics in heterogeneous cancer cell models to identify vulnerabilities, so-called dependencies, in every cancer cell. A map of cancer dependencies and the biomarkers that predict them could serve to accelerate the development of precision cancer medicines. This includes collaborations with multiple partners in the US, Europe, and Asia. We anticipate a cancer dependency map could have a number of important uses. It'll help identify new targets in defined molecular contexts, as well as rules to predict why patients respond to certain therapies and others don't. It'll also identify opportunities for drug repurposing, including the repurposing of non-oncology agents, and should also help identify rules to develop rational combination therapies. More broadly, it will give insights into gene function and the cellular states that exist in cancers, as well as insights into tissue specificity in carcinogenesis and in modulating therapy response. The Sanger effort is composed of four main parts, or what we call programs, each of which contains multiple individual projects that contribute to the larger whole. And these are broadly defined into depth map models, drugs, genes, and analytics. And we see these as very much as some of the core components that are required to deliver on a dependency map. To create a cancer dependency map, we are using a large panel of cancer cell models representing 43 different cancer types for genetic and functional studies. And we use this large collection of cancer models to have representation of different molecular subtypes that occur in patient populations and underpin differential therapy response. To date, Sanger and Broad Institutes together have systematically generated datasets for over 1,900 cancer cell lines, including genomic, epigenomic, proteomic, and functional datasets, including CRISPR screening and drug testing. Coverage of the cell lines for each data type is shown in the image. And we continue to expand these datasets through the development of new cancer models and their enhanced annotation with new molecular data or phenotypes and the number of functional datasets. At the Sanger, we host three integrated public databases to facilitate access to these datasets of their analysis. These include the GDSC, which hosts, hosts information on drug activity and biomarkers, the Cell Model Passports, which is a hub for genetic, functional, and clinical data on cell models, and Project SCORE, which maps genetic dependencies and targets. Collectively, these receive over 80,000 visits per year, and the datasets are used by other databases. So our efforts to use genetic screens to identify cancer dependencies and new oncology targets is called Project SCORE. And the focus of my presentation today will be on how we were using CRISPR screens to identify new candidate oncology targets, and really focusing on some new data, validating Werner helicase as a candidate target in mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer, and in particular in the setting of treatment refractory disease. So several years ago, we initiated a project to identify new targets. And we performed genome-wide CRISPR-Cas9 knockout screens in 324 cell lines. All of the cell lines have been extensively genetically characterized through DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing. And as an aside, there are actually today 
integrated data sets now combining CRISPR screens generated at the Sanger and the Broad Institute covering over 900 unique cancer cell lines. And so using these data sets, we developed a systematic approach to try and nominate and prioritize new oncology targets, which I'll just very briefly mention here. We began by identifying genes which are required for the fitness of a subset of cancer cell lines, so-called context-specific cancer genes. Core fitness genes were excluded because we reasoned that they were more likely to be associated with non-selective toxicity in normal healthy cells. And we integrated these fitness scores for each gene with evidence that the target is perturbed in patients and cells, if the context-specific dependency can be linked to a genetic biomarker, and whether there was evidence at the pathway level that that target is important. And we performed this analysis considering each cancer type individually, as well as combining all cancers together. And finally, as a last step, we also integrated tractability evidence to determine the potential drug ability of each target and each gene in the genome. And together, this gave us a ranked list of targets based on a priority score for each cancer type and pan-cancer. And so we identified over 600 candidate priority targets using this approach, binned here by tractability. And this includes many known drug targets, what we refer to as group one targets, supporting the utility of our prioritization approach because we identified the majority of known drug targets that exist today. But we also identified many new targets. And in particular, group two targets are exciting because these are targets with a high priority score, but also have evidence of tractability. And in particular, we identified Werner helicase as a promising candidate target. Werner helicase is a strong selective dependency in mismatch repair deficient microsatellite unstable cancer cells from ovarian, colorectal, as well as when looking pan-cancer. What's shown here is the fitness effect of knocking out Werner in different cancer cell lines, comparing microsatellite unstable and microsatellite stable populations. Through a series of validation studies, we confirmed that loss of Werner is synthetic lethal in MSI cells, resulting in apoptosis. And using an inducible system, we examined the effect of Werner knockout on tumor cell growth in vivo using mouse xenograft models. Tumors of MSI colorectal cancer cells were established, and then we induced Werner knockout using doxycycline. We observed a robust suppression of tumor growth, whereas control tumors continued to grow. This is shown in the left-hand side panel. This also led to reduced cell proliferation as measured by KI67 staining and an induction of apoptosis in tumor cells. And so together, these published studies supported Werner as a putative target in microsatellite unstable colon cells. Our finding that MSI status confers a synthetic lethal dependency on Werner helicase was co-published with a study from the Broad Institute and has now been supported by multiple independent groups. This has led to drug discovery programs to develop Werner helicase as a target. But notably, in these initial studies, the mechanism of Werner dependency was unclear, but there were already some clues emerging. So we had examined the impact of acute modulation of the mismatch repair genes on Werner dependency to see if we could actually rescue or induce Werner dependency in cells. And so as shown in the top half of this slide, we first utilized a published set of isogenic cell lines where mismatch repair had been reconstituted in a mismatch repair deficient cell line through re-expression of MSH3 and MLH1, either individually or together. And strikingly, despite reconstituting mismatch repair by expression of these genes, we were unable to rescue the dependency on Werner helicase. And we actually performed the converse experiment by knocking out mismatch repair gene MLH1 in a microsatellite stable cell line. And again, we did not 
observe the induction of Werner dependency. And so these data suggested that acute modulation of mismatch repair does not actually impact on Werner dependency. And at the time, we hypothesized that Werner could be required to resolve genomic structures present in mismatch repair deficient cells, so-called genomic scars, and actually failure to efficiently resolve these underpins the synthetic lethal dependency. A recent elegant study has shed further light on the mechanism. Using a combination of genetic and biochemical studies, the authors proposed a model whereby in mismatch deficient cells, you get an accumulation of expanded TA dinucleotide repeats in the DNA of cells. This is consistent with a genetic scar mechanism. This creates secondary structures, which Werner is required to unwind and resolve to maintain genome integrity. But in the absence of Werner, these structures persist and are cleaved by the MUS81 nuclease, resulting in chromosome shattering. These expanded TA repeats will be important later in my talk. Mismatch repair deficiency occurs in multiple cancer types, and in about 15% of sporadic colorectal cancers. And these patients are treated with surgery and chemotherapy, and also respond well to immune checkpoint inhibitors. So on the left-hand side panel are the results of the Checkmate 142 clinical trial evaluating a PD-1 inhibitor in the setting of mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer. And you can see many of these patients achieve a good and durable response. A number of targeted therapy approaches have also been developed to treat these patients. So for example, as shown on the right, the triple therapy combination of encorafenib, binimetinib, and cetoximab has been approved for the treatment of BRAF mutant colorectal cancer patients. And so while some patients do achieve good and durable clinical responses to these different treatments, many other patients develop resistant, resistance and treatment toxicity is an issue. And so following the initial discovery of Werner as a th synthetic lethal target, we set out to actually robustly evaluate MSI and mismatch repair deficiency as a biomarker for Werner dependency across diverse molecular backgrounds of colorectal cancer. In addition, we also reasoned that any future Werner-targeted medicines would likely be developed in the setting of heavily pretreated patients, and so also evaluated Werner synthetic lethality in the setting of models of treatment refractory disease. Now, the results from these studies, which I'm presenting for the first time, are impressive cancer discovery and have been a close collaboration with the laboratories of Alberto Bardelli and Emil Voist. So we began by using either RNA interference and CRISPR knockout to evaluate Werner dependency in a really diverse, heterogeneous set of mismatch uh, repair deficient preclinical cancer models. And in fact, we brought together what we believe is the largest collection of these models ever um, generated. And in total, we evaluated Werner dependency in 38 previously untested models and combined this with published data for 22 models. So what you're showing here is just the viability effect of knockdown of Werner compared to, for example, uh, the positive control PLK1. PLK1. And what you can hopefully see readily is that the majority of cell models are in fact Werner dependent. But inter interestingly, as shown on the left-hand side, we identified a small number of Werner-independent mismatch repair deficient cell lines. And we confirmed the presence of these Werner-independent models using Werner knockout together with colony formation assays. And so that's shown just in the top right-hand side of the panel. In addition, Whereas Werner knockout leads to profound chromosomal shattering in MSI Werner dependent cells, as typified by SW48, no, we saw no effect in Werner independent cells. So the genomes were well preserved, consistent with the fact that Werner didn't seem to be required for the viability of these cells, in contrast 
to Werner dependent populations. And so combining all these different data sets, we actually compiled a landscape of Werner dependency across 60 unique microsatellite unstable mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer models. And overall, we found about 90% of MSI models are Werner dependent. But there are actually a rare subset of models which are Werner independent. And as I think illustrated here, really just to point out that Werner dependency was observed in models from primary and metastatic disease, in different types of models, so cell lines, organoids, and PDX-derived 2D models, and was completely independent of the underlying driver lesion. So for example, whether, the, whether it was a KRAS or BRAF mutant. Also, in contrast to immunotherapy response, Werner dependency appeared to be independent of the overall mutational burden. And so through integration of multiple mutation gene expression and protein expression data sets, we confirmed that all MSI cell lines have one or more alterations in the mismatch repair genes. But interestingly, when we compared the Werner-dependent and independent populations, we observed a statistically insignificant enrichment for MSH2 and MLH1 mutations in Werner-dependent models compared to Werner-independent cell models, suggesting that alterations in specific mismatch repair genes might actually confer the Werner dependency. To understand why some microsatellite unstable colorectal cancers are Werner independent, we used an established PCR-based size analysis approach to test for the presence of expanded TA repeats that recurrently occur in mismatch deficient cells, and which consequently are recurrently broken in the absence of Werner, so-called broken repeats. Failure to PCR amplify across eight identified repeat regions provides indirect evidence that that repeat is expanded. And indeed, we confirmed the presence of expanded re TA repeat regions in MSI Werner-dependent cells compared to microsatellite stable cells. In contrast though, MSI Werner independent cells had little or no evidence of expanded TA repeats. We also used whole genome sequencing to examine these TA repeats. And this is because the recurrently broken TA repeats have actually reduced sequencing coverage compared to unbroken TA repeats. And so if you actually look within the set of broken TA repeats on the left-hand side of the box and whisker plot, we find that MSI Werner dependent cell lines have reduced sequencing coverage compared to MSS cells. So comparing the green and the um, red uh, samples. And again, here we saw that the Werner independent cells are much more similar to the MSS cells. And so taken together, our results suggest that Werner synthetic lethality is observed across a heterogeneous collection of mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancers, really strongly supporting MSI as a biomarker. But there exists, however, a rare subset of mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancers, which are not dependent upon Werner. And these are characterized by an absence of MLH1 and MSH2 alteration and an absence of these expanded TA repeats. And so collectively, this suggests that the majority of mismatch repair deficient patients would respond to a Werner targeted medicine, but there exists a small molecularly defined subset that would presumably be refractory to treatment. So patients with treatment refractory um, mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer represent an unmet clinical need and would benefit from any future Werner-targeted medicines. And so we hypothesized that cell models resistant to chemotherapy and targeted therapies might retain Werner dependency. So to test this, we used a collection of mismatch deficient cell models 
of acquired resistance to clinically relevant single agent and combination targeted therapies. So the drug resistant cell lines and their parental counterparts are shown in the upper panel. And remarkably, following Werner knockout with CRISPR or knockdown with RNAi, every single therapy resistant cell line we've looked at remained acutely dependent on Werner, similar to the parental clone from which it was derived. And that's just shown in the left hand side, sorry, the bottom half of the panel. So for example, Werner dependency was maintained in cell models of a required resistance to the triple therapy combination of dibrafenib, cetoximab, and trametinib, which is approved for the treatment of BRAF and colorectal cancers. We also performed a similar set of experiments, but focusing on cell models of resistance to standard of care chemotherapy agents. So similarly, we derived resistant clones through chronic drug exposure. And overall, we tested 13 different models of chemoresistance, representing different cell lines and chemotherapies. And in all cases, Werner dependency was retained. In the two examples shown, Werner dependency was retained in two MSI cell lines resistant to oxaliplatin, 5-FU, or arinotecan all drugs that are used for the treatment of colorectal cancer patients. And finally, we examined whether mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer tumors responding poorly to immunotherapy are also dependent upon Werner. And here we made use of a very elegant model system that's been previously established, um, where we have an organoid model from a mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer patient, CRC12, together with patient matched tumor reactive T cells that are generated by two weeks of co culturing peripheral blood mononuclear cells with the tumor organoid. And this is shown schematically on the left hand side. And CRC12 organoids are then killed by these autologous tumor reactive T cells, and that's shown in the bar plot in the middle of the image on the red bars. And so to generate a model of resistance, we selected a subpopulation of CRC12 cells resistant to T cell killing through multiple rounds of in vitro selection with these T cells. And as expected, these cells, which we call CRC12 resistant, are refractory to T cell mediated cell killing. And that's shown by the purple bars in the middle panel. And this is despite actually retaining MHC1 and interferon gamma expression and no B2M mutations were present. But I think most importantly, if you look at the right hand panel, this T cell refractory model retained a very potent dependency on Werner helicase. And so to test this further, we used two additional organoid cultures derived from mismatch repair deficient patient that had two lesions with variable clinical response to immunotherapy. And again, we induced T cells by incubating the PBMCs, which were actually taken prior to treatment. We incubated these PBMCs with the two different organoids. So what we see is that after two weeks of co-culture with, um, with, of T cells with four, CRC14A, which comes from the responsive metastatic lesion, we observed marked and selective CD8 positive T cell reactivity against the organoid from which those T cells were generated. So that's shown in the bar plot on the bottom left hand side. Now in contrast, when CRC14B organoids derived from the non-responding tumor were used in this co-culture system, no T cell reactivity was detected against any of the organoid lines. And so these data support that CRC14B is a model of immune refractory disease. And importantly, and shown on the bottom right hand side of the panel, we observed an acute dependency on Werner following knockout in the CRC14B organoid model 
derived from the immunotherapy non-responding lesion. And so collectively, the results from this study support the continued development of Werner-targeted medicines, and MSI as a robust biomarker in heterogeneous patients. Furthermore, as potent and selective Werner drugs are developed, our findings will inform patient selector strategies and really provide a strong rationale for their clinical development in patients with mismatch repair deficient tumors not benefiting from current therapeutics alone. I've illustrated how the cancer dependency map can lead to new biological insights and the identification of candidate therapeutic targets. These datasets are widely used, but much more needs to be done. New and better cancer models are required to reflect disease diversity, disease stage, and representation of the tumor microenvironment. There are many perturbations to be tested, including drug repurposing and the modulation of genes using CRISPR approaches, either individually and in combination. Much more could be learned by measuring additional phenotypes ideally at single cell resolution and with spatial and temporal resolution. We will need to establish platforms for data sharing and integration and things like artificial intelligence deployed to interpret these rich data sets. New technologies will help us to investigate novel aspects of biology and the deployment of new and existing technologies efficiently and at scale. And of course, close interaction with drug discovery teams and clinicians is necessary to realize the potential of a dependency map to impact patients. So great progress is being made in individual labs and teams, but a coordinated community approach to create a cancer dependency map would enable more and faster discoveries, improve reproducibility, and ultimately accelerate progress for patients. So I'd just like to conclude by thanking the many people involved in these studies. In particular, showing here are the people who have been involved in our most recent work looking at Werner dependency in the setting of treatment refractory disease. I'd also like to thank the DAPMAP steering committee members at the Broad Institute and the Sanger Institute, many other collaborators who have contributed in various ways over many years, and of course my funders without whom this work would not be possible. Thank you very much.